Hello, Jim Levis here. I'm here with Diane Coyle of University of Manchester, also of Enlightenment Economics, a consultancy and a great blog, and most importantly for today, the author of GDP, A Brief but Affectionate History. Um, hi there. It's a pleasure to be here talking about GDP, my favourite subject. I know, our favourite subject too. This is my holiday reading from last summer, but I thought it'd be <laughs> great to come in because it is the most important indicator still that markets look at. Um, if you look at this built big bull market we've had in uh, fixed income over the last year, arguably you could date that back to the disappointing first quarter US GDP numbers that we had uh, last year. But it is a relatively new economic statistic, isn't it? I mean, less than 100 years old. Dates from uh, the Second World War, essentially. It's really interesting looking back into the history. Back in the 17th century and 18th century, what people cared about was how much tax could be raised to fight the wars that England was involved in against France at the time. All the way through the 19th century, nobody really cared much about the aggregate activity in the economy because nobody expected anybody to do anything about it. And it wasn't until the 1930s and the Depression that there was first any expectation that when there was a trade cycle, the government would step in and try and fix things. So that created the demand um, in the UK and the US to have a number that set out what was happening to the economy as a whole. They knew you know, how many trains were being manufactured or uh, how many banks were going bust, but no total. So that started the process. And Simon Kuznets in the US, Colin Clark in the UK, started working out how you would compile an aggregate figure. But um, interestingly, they wanted to measure well-being, welfare, which is quite a modern, it's come around again in, in, in modern discussions, mm -hmm. and not just uh, activity. So Kuznets thought, for example, that advertising was a real negative and should not be included in, in his aggregate measure. Second World War intervened because the interest of governments then was to know what was the capacity to make stuff to fight the war and what sacrifice were consumers going to have to make. Uh, to sustain the war effort. And so our modern concept of GDP, um, uh, with Keynes as its father and his understanding of macroeconomics, that was when it came into being. So as you say, it's a really quite new concept. And it's quite difficult to get your head around some of the concepts, such as if I, if I got your book now and threw it through the window there, um, the window would be destroyed and y that wouldn't be captured in GDP necessarily, but me putting a new window in would. It would increase GDP and things like you know, uh, defence or bombs going off actually generate GDP rather than being destructive to it in some ways. Well, they, um, what's not counted is the destruction of the assets, the breaking of the window or the uh, destruction of the buildings in a natural disaster. So that's not counted in GDP, which is just the flow of activity over a certain period of time. But then you, you do count the rebuilding, the guys who come and fix the window pane, that does count as part of GDP. So that's one of the paradoxes involved in the, in the concept. And I guess the other, one other criticism of GDP is because it's such a complicated statistic to, to measure and there are lots of different ways that the ONS or whoever has to go about adding up all the activity in the economy, it's very, very subject to revision. And you know, we've, we've seen time and time again in the bond markets that what you thought was an awful quarter for the UK or the US economy or a very strong one turns out, even five years later, to have been a very normal or, in fact, exactly the opposite. So, so how useful is it and what kind of problems can that cause for a government? Well, the revisions certainly do change history. The triple dip recession that we thought we had got revised away. Um, Dennis Healy as Chancellor in 1976 famously had to call in the assistance of the IMF um, because of statistics that um, turned out to be uh, completely revised away later and um, you know, changed the course of political and, and social history in the country because Mrs Thatcher then won the next election. And it is, it is a useful um, concept for macroeconomic policy. I and mean, obviously the Bank of England and the Treasury, or their equivalents in other countries, need to have some idea of how growth is going to know how to set macroeconomic policy. So, so we need something like it. But I think we put mu much too much weight on it. And in the markets, it's one thing because um, you, you, know, you want to react to those short-term changes. But setting public policy by things that are not only going to get revised, but the number itself is within the margin of error of the statistics. It seems to me we ought to be much more cautious about that. It's not that it, you know, there's no, it's not like measuring a mountain, the height of a mountain. There's no right answer. There are lots of judgments that go into how you define it and how you measure those different components. I guess one thing we talk about on our, our bond desk is that it, it's felt to us that 
employment has been very, very strong in the UK over you know since the end of the uh, the downturn, and yet the the GDP numbers have seemed quite weak relative. Uh, some of that has now been revised away, but is there something else going on? Maybe technological change. How do you measure the fact that an iPhone 6 is better than an iPhone 5, and should it be delivering more GDP? You know, so how do you account for technology or the fact that we might book our holidays online rather than go through um, a branch of a, a travel agent on the high street which may have closed down and look like that's negative for GDP, but actually we're, we're, we're deriving lots more growth and lots more good for individuals and for, for companies, yet we don't know how to capture that yet. Do you think that the GDP numbers are, are keeping up with technological change? Now you've touched on a really interesting issue and I think the answer is they're probably not. It's never been a really good way of capturing very big technological innovations. And the example uh, that struck me was um, Nathan Mayer Rothschild, richest man in the world at the time, died of an infected abscess on his tooth in 1836, for which you could now buy an antibiotic for a few pounds to cure in a day. And how much would he have paid for access to that technology? So the sort of life-changing welfare effects of new technologies have never been well captured. But it's got worse because of the way the economy is changing. GDP was devised in the Second World War for a sort of mass production manufacturing economy. And it counts s numbers of things. So to count the number of cars rolling off the production line is pretty straightforward. Um, but when you're talking about a computer whose characteristics change dramatically over time, you know, now they've got Wi-Fi and cameras built in and better screens, so you're paying the same money for something that's much better than a little while ago. Um, how do you account for the fact that um, there's so much more variety in the goods that you can customise anything that you buy, 3D printing is coming along. And then there's all the intangible value as well. And I think, as you're pointing out, they're just not very good at capturing um, that, that intangible element in a, in a service-based and digital economy. I, I don't think we quite know um, what it is that we ought to be cap capturing either. Because something like your travel agency example, that's a sort of pure efficiency gain because the matching of demand and supply goes on better in these digital markets. And um, that's, that's different from just not measuring something very well because we don't know how to make the adjustment for the different characteristics in a computer. And that's different again from something like um, being a nurse where there are two possible definitions of productivity. It's either that you get through more people in a day, more patients in a day, or you get through fewer patients in a day, but you're caring for them better. And both of those might be relevant. You know, for blood tests, you want to do them quickly and get through lots. For caring for a terminally ill patient, you want to have that quality of time. And I don't think we've got the concepts in place yet to come up with something different. Well, that's probably going to be my, my final question then. You know, is it fit for purpose? And if it isn't, what, what is there out there that, that's better? I mean, David Cameron's talked about concepts of well-being and, uh, you know, famously the King of Bhutan or has talked about gross national happiness being a goal rather than GDP. Is, is there anything that, that, that policymakers should be looking at as a, a, a one-size-fits-all measure that's any better than what we know is flawed but is, is good as it gets? Well, GDP does something pretty straightforward, which is measuring marketed economic activity, which has some uses still, so I wouldn't throw it away just yet. I'm sceptical about happiness myself because um, it could be an excuse for not doing much to improve people's lives. And um, you, know, you mentioned Bhutan, it's a very poor country, it's, it's a very illiberal country, and so they might be happy, but I think that just tells you that humans have a great capacity for getting used to things and making the best of it and being, and being happy anyway. But I think there's a debate about whether you want one single measure or whether you want to have a dashboard of measures, like the dashboards that many companies use now to keep track of how they're doing. And the argument for one measure is that it's um, politically useful to hold governments to account and it's easy to explain in the media, you know, it's going up or down by so much. And the argument for a dashboard is that actually um, in a very prosperous society like this, you want to look at a range of different things and there are trade-offs. So you want to look at environmental quality as well as employment growth and um, per capita GDP, as well as you know, work-life balance or how far you have to commute. And there are some of these dash dashboards around and I think they're quite interesting to look at. So that's my preference, but there is an argument for trying to think, rethink what would the single indicator be if you wanted to have one. Dan Cole, thank you very much. Thank you.